Welcome to our last session. It is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Lackey from Northwestern University. She will talk to us about the norms of testimonial uptake. Thank you, and thanks to um, John and Eleanor um, for putting together such a great conference and for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, um, so what I'm going to be talking about today are a particular, it's a particular kind of norm, the norms specifically governing, um, I'm calling it broadly testimonial uptake. That's going to be, I'm going to have to kind of clarify exactly what I'm talking about as the, as the, the talk goes on. Uh, I'm going to be focusing most specifically on our assessment of other people as testifiers. That's really going to be the focus of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, what norms govern our assessment of other of persons, of other persons? So broadly, um, I'm just kind of starting with like a broadly evidentialist framework. That's not to say that I'm, I'm kind of espousing evidentialism. It's more like this is kind of one way we might kind of think about, particularly when we're thinking about norms, okay? So we might think that, um, you know, like let's just kind of take a broad evidentialist view, um, like on your handout, you know, the traditional one um, from um, Earl, uh, you know, Feldman and Connie. Um, and so, you know, according to them, dogmatic attitude D toward proposition P is epistemically justified for S at T if and only if having D toward P fits the evidence S at T. So if something like this kind of, you know, kind of generic evidentialism is correct, then it's very clear what the norm governing our beliefs would be, just in general. Okay, what, would, what should we do if we're trying to kind of you know, what, as epistemic agents, what should we be trying to do? We'll have our beliefs fit the evidence. Okay. Now, we have beliefs about all sorts of things, about, you know, coffee cups and computers, but we also have beliefs about persons, okay? And their, and how they are as sources of information. So, one question we might ask is whether the um, way that we go about assessing, you know, everything else, non-persons, is the same standards, the same norms that we should be using when we're assessing persons, okay? Now, at least for, um, there you know, are at least some reasons why we might think that um, there are some differences. Now, I'm not saying that all of these, I mean, we'll, we're, the question that I'm going to ask is whether these differences make any important epistemic or moral differences. But at least with respect to persons, for instance, we have relationships with them. Okay, not trusting persons can have impacts on our interpersonal relationships. Stakes can be very, very high for persons, whether or not they're believed, okay, whether or not what they're telling us you know, kind of is accepted, um, can matter a great deal for them, depending on what they're, they're testifying to. So there are at least some, you know, kind of, you know, clear differences between persons and non-persons um, with respect to our assessment of them. And the question is, does this bear as, you know, kind of as hearers, does this bear in any way on what we are obligated to do in terms of our, our assessment of their testimony? Okay. So, um, so, working with this kind of broadly, you know, kind of evidentialist picture, we might think that um, the way that we ought to go about assessing um, people's testimony would be something like this. And this um, evidentialist norm of testimonial uptake, this I think kind of falls out of evidentialism, but I think um, in like Miranda Fricker's book on testimonial injustice, she explicitly, this is, a, this is kind of in a way how she characterizes um, the norm governing testimonial uh, credibility assessment. She says a hearer H should match the credibility judgment of a speaker S to the evidence that S is offering the truth. Okay, so this would just be a, a, just a broad evidentialist norm of testimonial uptake. Specifically here we're talking about credibility assessment. I'm sort of blurring those two. I'll distinguish them more clearly as we move on. The difference between taking up the belief and assessing the, the source. Okay, so um, what I want to do today is um, I want to look, so we're, we're, that kind of evidentialist norm would be very compatible with a broad, like our broad picture of how we ought to just assess, you know, kind of, you know, assess things in general, right? If this kind of evidentialist norm is right, then there's not really an important difference between persons and non-persons with respect to their testimony in this sense, right? I mean, it's just, you know, we're all just kind of sources of evidence. 
And um, the way that we ought to assess people as evidence is really on an epistemic par, and perhaps even on a moral par, with how we ought to assess non-persons. What I'm going to do today is look at several different attempts that have been made to say that that's false, that picture is false, okay? That we need different kinds of norms um, governing our assessment of persons, okay? And there's, you're gonna see today that there's, like, there's gonna be epistemic arguments, there's gonna be moral arguments. Oftentimes these are kind of put together in our arguments for these sorts of claims. I'm gonna try to pull them apart and, and you know, kind of keep distinct these different kinds of assessments. But I'm going to look at three different attempts, three different kinds of norms that people have said um, are specific with respect to persons, okay? So that they vary, um, that, these, that these are norms that are distinctive to our assessment of persons. Um, the first kind is going to focus on um, norms being in a way of assessment, of credibility assessment, being grounded in our interpersonal relations. The second one is going to be that somehow the stakes um, with respect to the hearer, the state, you know, the, the, I'm sorry, the speaker stakes make a big difference. And the third is that the content is going to matter a great deal, okay? All three of these claims say, look, there's something unique about this category, okay? And so we need to have like special norms or additional norms or somehow we can't have this general norm that applies across the board. And I'm going to actually find each of these attempts to be wanting. And so ultimately, I'm going to put forward a different norm. It's not really, um, it's actually going to be picking up on, I think, some of the things that Sandy was, was um, um, arguing in the, the talk before. I'm going to um, suggest a, you know, a fairly revised version of this broadly evidentialist norm. Um, it's going to have, it's going to have a, a, several different kinds of revisions. But the upshot of what I'm going to be arguing today is that, at least with respect to credibility assessments, we can have a general norm. Okay? We don't need to kind of distinguish these. We can treat other persons in a way just like we treat everybody, everything else. Um, and also that, that we're not going to be subject to any sort of epistemic or moral criticism for doing that. Okay? Um, so that's going to be the plan for today. Okay. Um, so, so the first thing I want to do is um, <clears throat> look at this on your handout, um, the evidentialist norm, EN. Okay. Okay, so one thing that I think is interesting is that, so, so as it's put, I mean, we can read this just kind of purely in an epistemic way, right? Okay, it's just saying, like, look, when we're assessing, credibility assessments ought to match the evidence that what the person is saying is true, okay? The evidence that we have that the person is, is telling the truth. One of the things that I think is really interesting about um, Mir Miranda Fricker's um, work on this is that she also thinks that there's, like, a really important moral dimension to satisfying this norm. So she thinks that, um, so as I'm sure many of you know, she um, develops this concept of testimonial injustice. And she says that um, speakers suffer testimonial injustice when they suffer a credibility deficit owing to identity prejudice, okay? The identity prejudice has to be systematic for Miranda, so it has to be kind of a, she thinks the paradigmatic instances are social identity, so things like race and, and gender, things that kind of, you know, follow people through a wide range of contexts, okay? And it has to be systematic in order for it to be testimonial and justice. But the part that I think is, is, is interesting is that, or that I think is interesting for, for my purposes today, is that for Miranda, um, violating this norm has significant moral um, significance, right? So for her, she, she says that if we, if we give someone, if someone suffers a credibility deficit owing to this identity prejudice, where a credibility deficit is not assessing someone in accordance with the, with the evidence, right? Not, a, not assessing them properly vis-a-vis -vis the evidence that you have, then that, and it's done for these, for a particular reason. So I'm just going to just assume when I talk about this that I'm saying, and it's done for bad reasons, you know, for, because, because of sexism or racism. So I don't want to have to say that every time. But when someone suffers a credibility deficit for these bad reasons, 
then the person is the victim of testimonial injustice and they've been wronged in their capacity as a knower. Okay. So she gives this, I don't even know if I have this on your handout, but she says, um, okay. So she says, a speaker sustains testimonial injustice if and only if she receives a credibility deficit owing to identity prejudice in the hearer. So the central case of testimonial injustice is identity prejudicial credibility deficit. Okay. So someone suffers testimonial injustice for Miranda if and only if they suffer a credibility deficit that's owing to identity prejudice. So the thing that's really interesting here is that satisfaction of this norm okay, puts one in both the epistemic and the moral clear, so to speak, relative to credibility assessment, right? I mean, I'm not saying that like you're not doing anything epistemically or morally wrong, full stop. But if, I mean, all I'm talking about today is our assessment of, of, of you know, people's credibility, okay? So when I say you're in the epistemic or moral clear, I mean relative to that assessment, okay? So the thing that's interesting here is that on this view, we're in the epistemic and the moral clear in terms of our assessment of people by virtue of satisfying this one norm, okay? So the norm applies broadly, and it has a lot of payoff, right? Because we're getting, you know, kind of we're getting both epistemic and moral mileage out of it. Okay. Um, so I want to draw a couple of distinctions just for clarificatory purposes. So I think as it stands, um, the norm needs some clarification just to kind of get started. So, um, so the first thing I want to draw a distinction is between what I call the categorical reading and a conditional reading of the norm. So, one reading of it is saying that hearers are required not only to have their credibility judgments of speakers track the available evidence, but also to make such judgments in the first place, right? So, in one reading of this, it's that like anyone who's testifying to us, anyone that we're encountering, okay, we need to be assessing their credibility. Okay, so the way I have put this on your handout is um, for every speaker S and here H, H should match the credibility judgment of S to the evidence that S is offering the truth. So for every speaker and every hearer. Okay. Um, the problem with this reading, I mean, is that we pro we get, we get, there's a lot of testimony that we take in where we don't assess the, the persons, you know, from whom we're getting it. And we don't necessarily think that we have to, right? I mean, if we're walking down the street and people are kind of shouting at us about like, you know, like trying to sell us things or, you know, kind of there's billboards and we're taking in information there and, you know, kind of um, we're overhearing a conversation on the subway or something. There's a lot of testimony that we're exposed to. And we might not necessarily think that we're kind of um, violating a norm or subject to any sort of criticism for not evaluating all of those instances, all of those speakers, right? Kind of constantly engaging in evaluation. I mean, it's not clear that like, if I'm just kind of scrolling very, very quickly through the internet, right? You know, kind of, or like on my Facebook feed, you know, let's see, that, that I'm like you know, assessing every single source, you know what I mean, of, of, that's on my feed, okay? Um, so we might think that kind of a categorical reading is just kind of too strong, right? Like that for every speaker and every hearer, Okay. We need to be, um, you know, having our assessments match the evidence. Um, so we might think that we might, what, might want to understand the norm more in a conditional sense, right? So for every speaker S and here H, if, you, if H makes a credibility assessment of S, then H should match it to the evidence that S is offering the truth. Um, one of the concerns that we would have with this formulation is if, is if, if this is all that we have is this conditional norm. We would need to have some, something guiding when we make these credibility assessments, okay? Because it can't just be that, like, if you happen to so assess someone's credibility, then you should have it match the evidence, where there's no go norm governing when you ought to be making the credibility assessments, right? I mean, because surely there's all sorts of, I mean, especially if we're interested in like a phenomenon like testimonial injustice, I mean, this is gonna be rampant, right? You just don't listen to members of minority groups. You just don't assess them at all, right? They're not even worthy. I mean, in some ways, it's actually could be some of the most pernicious forms of racism and sexism. Like, they're not even worthy of assessment, right? Um, so if I'm going to assess you, then I have to make, you know, my credibility judgment match the evidence. Mm, I'll satisfy the norm. I just won't assess you. You know what I mean? 
This is not supposed to be an objection to you know, the initial formulation. All I'm doing is pulling out these different strands and saying that concealed in this kind of discussion is, are, I think, two different questions, each of which is important. The first is, when do we need to assess people? Like, what are the conditions under which we need to assess people? And then when, when we do, what do we have to do? OK. Um, so I'm going to really be focusing on the second one today. I'm going to be focused on assuming, I'm just going to assume from here on out that all, we're always assessing when we ought to be. OK. That's just going to be the background. OK. Given that we're assessing when we ought to be, I want to ask the question, what do we need to do? OK? OK. So, um, so basically, I'm going to be focusing on the conditional EN for the remainder of the paper. And um, assuming, as I said, that, uh, that, the, that we're making credibility assessments when we ought to be. OK. Okay, so if we assume that a hearer satisfies this norm, what it's saying is, it's what, it, what, what presumably follows from this would be three conclusions, okay? So if this is, the, if, if we're kind of going with this norm, being the norm governing, you know, our, um, what I'm calling, I'm calling these um, norms governing testimonial uptake, but um, I'm talking specifically, I'm not distinguishing very finely between assessing the credibility and then just taking up the belief. I will as a, a little bit later. Okay. So what follows from this then would be three different conclusions. One is the hearer is not subject to epistemic criticism in this, with respect to this evaluation. Okay. The hearer is not wronging the speaker in her capacity as a knower. And the speaker thereby does not sustain testimonial injustice. Okay. So if we're reading this norm, in the way that, for instance, someone like Miranda defends it, then those three conclusions would follow from its satisfaction, right? We're not subject to epistemic criticism, and we're not subject to moral criticism because the speaker is not sustaining testimonial injustice, OK? Remember, the claim was you suffer testimonial injustice if and only if the speaker sustains um, a credibility deficit owing to identity prejudice, OK? OK. So now I want to ask whether this is whether this is correct. Okay, should we um, should we accept this norm? Okay, does it does do these three conclusions follow from it from its satisfaction? So let's consider um, a group of scientists. Okay, and the male scientists in the lab have a few female colleagues. And um, they do not give the female colleagues a credibility deficit, OK? They actually, given the evidence that they have, they appropriately you know, kind of assess them, OK? They think that, you know, yes, and in fact, let's assume that the assessment is a positive, is an, is an epistemically positive one, OK? So they say, yes, that they're reliable. Okay. But suppose further that these male scientists always systematically give themselves a credibility surplus, OK? So now, some people in the literature have talked about, have, have criticized Miranda's work on the basis of saying she thinks it's only when you give speakers a credibility deficit that there is testimonial justice. And she's been criticized for people saying you can give speakers a credibil credibility surplus. I have not seen anyone. I mean, I don't, I mean I, I'm not saying that I've read everything on the topic, but I haven't seen anyone criticize a hearer surplus problem, OK? So the, the criticism would be like, look, I can actually, like, suppose that I give you a credibility surplus vis-a-vis, -vis, like, with respect to baking, because you're a woman, right? Some people have argued maybe you can suffer testimonial injustice in that way. But what I haven't seen discussed is how you can suffer, to, uh, how speakers, can suffer testimonial injustice by hearers giving themselves a credibility surplus. Okay. So imagine that um, these male scientists, the male, male scientists, always thinks like, yes, 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 you're very reliable. You, you know, given the evidence that I have, 
Um, I'm appropriately assessing you. It's just that, gosh, I'm always just that much better. Like, I'm always just that much more reliable. Okay. Now, it seems to me that if that assessment is illegitimate, right, if, and we can imagine that the assessment that I'm better is grounded in prejudice, right? It's grounded in some kind of sexism. It's just inconceivable. No, even if, I, if you're really good, you just simply couldn't be better than me. Okay. Now, given this kind of inflated sense of self, this kind of, you know, this sort of here or surplus phenomenon that I'm talking about, um, it seems that um, it's simply not the case that even though the norm is satisfied, the speaker is not the victim of testimonial injustice. Okay. So I want to make a few points here. Um, Now, I think it's pretty standard. I think it's pretty standard to think that um, to focus on speaker deficit, because it's very easy to think, look, if I assess you properly and I assess you to be reliable then belief is just going to come along for the ride, right? I mean, like, I think it's just an intuitive thing to think. Like, if I judge you to be reliable and you tell me that P, I will believe that P on the basis of your testimony. One of the things that I think is interesting about this kind of here or surplus phenomenon is it drives a very clear wedge between those two things, right? No matter how reliable I judge you, okay, so that I don't give you any deficit, there's no deficit, I give you everything that you're due, Okay. There can be a systematic wedge driven between that and my believing anything that you tell me okay, because of my inflated sense of self. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is like, while I think that focusing on these credibility deficits has been really important, okay, we have all sorts of empirical evidence about like implicit bias and you know, I think that you know, racial profiling, we've got all sorts of evidence for thinking that like, look, we really ought to be very conscious of not giving people proper assessments, right? You know, kind of not, you know, kind of giving them deficits. There's also a lot of empirical evidence that we are really delusional about ourselves, right? So there's this Dunning, you know, Kruger, you know, phenomenon, right? Where it's like it shows that, like, you know, kind of across context, systematically, you know, kind of the more incompetent we are, the more we think well of ourselves, right? It's precisely the incompetent people who think very highly of themselves. And the more competent you get, the more your self-assessment kind of becomes more realistic, right? But it's the, it's the very incompetent people, right, who are judging themselves to be so, you know, um, so competent. This is a serious worry, right? I mean, I think that we do need to kind of think about the, the credibility surplus. And I think that um, while I think focusing on, on, on our treatment of others and the, de and the deficit is really important. One thing that I want to bring out today, and I'm going to bring it out in a number of different ways, is that we impact others tremendously by how we treat, our, by how we assess ourselves. It's simply impossible for us to think that I can kind of do no wrong, epistemically or morally, by just giving you your due, okay? Because we're in, we all are in a social context, right? And how I assess myself in relation to you, and how I assess my, like, let's say, my male peers in relation to you, is going to make a big difference, even if I give you your due, right? Your epistemic due, right? So if I judge you kind of given the evidence, I judge you to be credible, but I judge all of the other male scientists to just be better. I always judge myself to be better. I'm still wronging you. And I'm gonna, I'll get to, I'll get to this a little bit later, but I'm gonna call this kind of a relational form of injustice, right? Okay. So, um, Okay. So the first point that I wanted to highlight by this here surplus case is where a, 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 like a wedge could be driven between the proper assessment and the uptake. Okay. So one thing that I think needs to be changed with the norm is that we don't just give the pr pr proper credibility assessment, but then we believe accordingly. 
okay, our, do our dog's astic attitudes or our just our attitudes ought to kind of, you know, the, the corresponding attitudes we, you know, kind of ought to take up, right? So, um, so I have this as, um, Oh, here, yes, Ian. For every speaker S and hearer H, if H makes a credibility assessment of S, then H should match it to the evidence that S is offering the truth and believe, disbelieve, or withhold accordingly. Okay, um, so this kind of takes care of driving that wedge, right, that I was worried about. But it, but it doesn't handle um, all of the dimensions of the hearer surplus problem. Because obviously, the, the way that the norm is formulated... It doesn't say anything about my assessment of myself here, right? It's saying, so long as I assess you properly and then take up the proper dogsastic attitude, I'm in the clear, okay? But it leaves out my assessment of myself and possibly other relevant people in that context, okay? So the way I put it here is, in other words, the norm focuses exclusively on our judgment of a single speaker, but leaves out our evaluations of not only the other members of the context in question, but also of ourselves. So one of the things that I think um, a norm of this sort ought to do, if especially, like, let's just keep in mind what we want out of this norm. I mean, assuming that we're going to follow you know, kind of the lead and say, we want this norm to have some epistemic and moral payoff, right? We want this norm to sort of be doing double duty, okay? I mean, especially if we're going to have an if and only if in there, right? Right? If and only if there, right? We're going to say, you suffer test, the speaker suffers testimonial injustice if and only if there's a credibility deficit. Then we really need this to do a fair bit of work. And one of the things that I think, if we really kind of have that ambitious aim, we need to do is we need it to kind of have the assessments not just be on a single speaker. Okay. I think that we need to, when we're making these assessments, they need to also take into account our assessments of that speaker in relation to other members of, in the relevant context. I'm not going to say a whole lot more other than like relevant context or relevant community. Um, you know, that's going to be, I mean, that's a, I've, I've got a lot of other things to do today. I can't, I mean, that would be a whole other topic to try to individuate, you know, relevant contexts and communities. Um, but the point is, like, when we're looking, for instance, in this, this kind of paradigmatic example that I'm using of these scientists, it's just simply not reasonable to think that assessing the um, female scientist properly, but everybody else improperly, is not going to impact her in very significant ways, both epistemically and morally, right? Um, so what I say is that what these considerations suggest is that um, there's, a, I think, a deep and important social dimension to the norm at issue here. Um, it can't be applied only to your assessment of, um, of me, for instance, completely independent of other members of the relevant context, including yourself. And like I said, this is because it matters not only how you judge me, but how you judge, like, for instance, my peers. Okay. Um, So, um, so one of the things that I, I want a, a general norm like this to do is to be sensitive to the fact, to this kind of relational form of, of, of you know, assessment. That how, uh, you know, how we're assessed, it matters a great deal um, how our peers and the other relevant members of our community are assessed as well. Okay, so that's the first problem. Um, that I think we, we need to handle, we need to take care of with respect to EN1. The second one is that there can also be, um, I don't think that this, case, that this problem is like really significant, um, but I think it's worth mentioning just so that we can make sure we take care of it in the norm. Um, so the first problem I raised was there can be the right assessment but lack of the proper attitude. We can also imagine that there can be the right assessment and the right attitude, but a deviant route, okay? And what I mean by that would be cases where um, I assess you in the right sort of way, I believe what you believe, but I don't believe it because you told me it. I believe it because, you know, the male scientists also believe it, or because I independently am inclined to believe it, or something like that. So we want to make sure that we just have a connection, the proper connection between the assessment and the belief in order for there to really be the proper satisfaction of the norm. Okay. Um, 
So with all of that said, um, here's what I propose EN2. For every speaker S and here are H, if H makes a credibility assessment of the relevant members of a context, S1 through SN, then, at, then H should match them to the evidence that S1 through SN are offering the truth and believe, disbelieve, or withhold accordingly on a basis that includes S's testimony. So a couple of things it includes, oh, I guess I should have had, sorry. I was revising this last night. That last S's should include, you know, kind of S1 through SN's testimony. It should be whichever speaker is offering, whichever speaker is offering it, it should include, that's, that should be included. So a couple of things about this. Um, one is that um, it's saying that um, there's, a, we need to give kind of the proper assessment to a relative, to, 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 a, you know, to, the, to the group of members. We can't have these radical asymmetries and think that there's no, kind of there are no epistemic or, or, or moral problems. Um, obviously, um, the epistemic problems I haven't even highlighted, but they're just obvious. If you're illegitimately giving yourself a credibility surplus, then obviously you're not believing in accordance with the evidence. So I haven't even really highlighted that. But obviously you're subject to epistemic criticism. I've really been focusing on some of the, um, the other ways you know, um, that you would be subject to criticism. Um, so two things that this revised norm does. One is that it includes the members of a context, and I would be including yourself in that. And two, it says that your basis for believing that P needs to include the relevant testimony. Okay, and that would deal with the last two problems. Okay, so um, what I now want to do is um, turn to some. Um, some views that challenge this, this kind of approach, that challenge that we can even kind of come up with a norm of this sort, okay? And the first, the first challenge that I want to look up, uh, take up, comes from Ashani Maitra, and she argues that, um, well here, I'll just read the, the quote, I think she just, she says it well. We hearers have no general obligation to match our credibility judgments to the evidence in every case. Where no such obligation exists, we do no wrong in failing to avoid a credibility deficit regardless of the reasons for the failure. Okay, so basically her view is there are just no general norms of this sort, okay? To give you kind of like the, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the heads up about what she's going to claim, she claims that all norms of this sort are parasitic on moral obligations we have grounded in particular relationships. Okay, so she doesn't think that there's any sort of general norm like this. If we don't have a particular interpersonal relationship that requires it, there's no general norm about assessing people's credibility. Okay, it has to be grounded in a particular interpersonal relationship. Okay. Okay, so she, to argue for this, she um, asks us to consider this case of um, Zara, who's working through the daily news and uses a few rough heuristics to call what she reads. Okay, so for example, though she likes to read writers from a broad range of political persuasions, there are some persuasions she can't take seriously. The Tea Party movement is one such persuasion. She has seen some of their most offensive protest placards, though she doesn't know that much about them, including what precisely they want and how they're different from other right-leaning groups. Today she comes across an item that opens with the writer identifying himself as a committed tea partier, as is her usual habit with such writers. Zara deletes the item, figuring she wouldn't be able to trust much of what the writer says. Okay, um, okay so, um, okay. What, what time am I supposed to talk till? I know, I just want to keep track. Oh, I have 25 minutes? No, I, that's not that, okay, okay. I have to start hurting. Okay, I had a lot to get through. Okay, so here's what, so here's what Ashani says. She says, intuitively, I think Zara does no injustice to the writer by dismissing him. In refusing to engage with him, she isn't being unfair to him. That's because she simply doesn't owe it to him to avoid a credibility deficit. It may be that Zara harms herself by depriving herself of sources of knowledge on topics she cares about, and it may also be that she fails to fulfill some obligations to herself to be rational. But testimonial injustice requires more than this, for it is by definition a kind of wrong done to another, the speaker, 
Because intuitively speaking, Zara does no injustice to the speaker, this shouldn't count as an instance of testimonial injustice. Okay. So, um, so, I'm going to try to do my best. I mean, I just don't share the intuition at all. So I'm just going to do my best to try to come up with an argument um, for why we would, we would think this. Um, so I take it that she's arguing something like this. Um, here's at least one way of understanding it. We might think that in order for the, you to be the victim of testimonial injustice of, of some sort, to be wronged in, your, in some sort of epistemic capacity, there has to be some sort of harm that's done to you. We might think this, right? And if I'm just kind of like scrolling through news, right? I mean, like, in, in what sense have I kind of wronged you or harmed you if there's absolutely no effect, no impact whatsoever? Like, you're not even aware of the fact that I've done this, right? I mean, there's nothing. I mean, imagine I'm never going to come, you know, bump into you again. Um, I mean, I think when we're thinking about like what we owe people in terms of like, you know, kind of assessing their credibility, I mean, it really is sort of fascinating to think about what we owe people on the internet, right? I mean, like, you know, when we're reading people's blogs or their Facebook posts, you know, like, what do we owe them, right? I mean, like, they have no idea, right, what I'm, you know, how I'm assessing them and that sort of thing. Um, but in this particular case, I think that one of the things that, it, I, I think one of the things that's motivating Ashani is this thought that there's just no obvious harm coming to this person, right? I mean, we can imagine you have, you're never going to see the person again. You know, you've never seen them at all. They have no idea you didn't believe them. You're not going to go tell people you didn't believe them. Literally, you just kind of were calling through your news and you're just like, mm, tea partier, and you just, you know, kind of turn the page. Um, I take it that's at least one way we might understand um, the argument that, that she gives here. Okay, so then she goes on to say that, um, as I said, she thinks we only have obligations to assess people when we have a prior relationship with them. And this doesn't have to be like kind of, a, you know, a friend or, you know, a, an intimate relationship. Like she uses the example that Miranda uses of um, the jury in To Kill a Mockingbird. She said they have a particular, they have a particular duty to assess his credibility qua juror. Okay. So we can have a lot of, we can have relationships, you know, qua teacher or, um, you know, qua, you know, kind of investigator and so on. So it doesn't have to, you know, when she says like relationships, it can be grounded in a lot of different professional relationships as well. But she thinks we only have these duties to assess against the backdrop of these interpersonal relationships. So um, the norm that she espouses, I call this the relationship-based norm of testimonial uptake for every speaker, S and here, H. If H and S already have a special interpersonal relationship and H makes a credibility assessment of S, then H should match it to the evidence that S is offering the truth and believe, disbelieve, or withhold accordingly on a basis that includes S's testimony. Okay. So this is the, this um, relationship based, I just kind of am using like the simpler version, not the version that talks about the context. But obviously if we were persuaded by the arguments earlier, then this relationship based norm would also have to take into account that we would need to be assessing I guess the relevant members of a context. Although that gets really tricky given that we, don't, we might not have relationships to many of the members in that context, right? I mean, so um, if we only have obligations to assess the people with whom we have relationships and we're in a lab or something and I have responsibilities to some and not to others, then it looks like on this model, um, the kind of relational sort of injustice that I was worried about is going to be coming out like you know, it, it's really going to be rearing its head frequently, right? Because um, even within those contexts, I only have to respond. You know, I will only have to assess certain certain people. Um, but anyway, so this would be this would be the kind of norm that um, this is the kind of norm that that Ashani wants to argue for. Okay. Okay. So um, so I guess I want to make a couple of points. The first is um, against the claim that even with someone like the Tea Partier, um, we're not violating any sort of, 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 of norm. So let's just start with the, with the epistemic side of things. I mean, I need to hear a little bit more about the Tea Party. I mean, like, I think that like, the, the example is sort of loaded because I think that many of us do in fact have evidence for turning the page on the Tea Partier, right? I mean, 
Um, and so we need to keep, keep in mind that if this example is really going to accomplish what Ashani wants it to accomplish, we, we truly have to kind of abstract away from all of our views about tea partiers and all of the evidence we have. I mean, I'm, I, I mean there could be a tea party out that means, but I'm just, anyway. <laughs> anyway, I don't know, and whatever. The point is just that, I mean, the point I want to emphasize is just this, okay? That it, the case has to be st structurally identical to a paradigmatic case of testimonial injustice, right? Where you turn the page because the person is, is, is black, for instance, right? Okay, it has, to be, it has to be analogous to that. So it can't be that what's doing the work here is any sort of evidence that we, in fact, you do have about Tea Party. So it really has to be that you have no, you know, no good evidence for thinking that this person is, that this, this is an unreliable source. None at all, okay? And that you are really kind of turning the page simply in virtue of this sort of systematic identity prejudice, okay? Like in the same way that the racist doesn't believe what the, I mean, like we really have to get our mind inside here, okay? Because I think that, um, like I said, it, she can only make this case if it's, if, it's, if, it's, if it's identical in that sort of way. And if that's the case, I mean, if it really is identical in that sort of way, then it's just unclear to me that, um, I mean, so first of all, we're obviously doing something epistemically improper if we're just dis dis discounting evidence for no good reason, right? I mean, that's pretty obvious. And then the question comes up, like, you know, have we kind of wronged this person in a, in a distinctively epistemic way? Right? I mean, is there, you know, where this is kind of a, a mixed moral epistemic evaluation, right? Because we're, we're, there, there's injustice, in their capacity as a knower, right? And I guess I want to say that, like, the only the only um, way I can see um, for Ashani to try to say that we haven't is by this argument that I suggested a little bit earlier, that we really don't wrong people unless there's some sort of overt kind of harm or something like that. And I think we should just reject that, right? I think that obviously there are all sorts of wrongs we can inflict on people, even when they have absolutely no idea that they've happened, there's no impact whatsoever. I mean, you know, if you cheat on, you know, if someone cheats on their partner and like there's absolutely no evidence, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but like none, I mean like, you know, the person with whom you've had the affair drops dead and you know, your behavior is identical to how it would have been had you not had, just stipulate all of that as the case. You've still wronged your partner. Right? I mean, even if there's nothing, not a single, you know, kind of harm that you've you've still wronged the person, right? I mean, and if you have like incredibly thick skin, I mean, incredibly thick skin, so that I mean, and we're in a quiet room, so no one even hears this, and I'm like, like throwing racial slurs at you, right? And you're just like, hmm, does it impact me at all? You know, like nothing. I feel nothing. I've still wronged you, right? I mean, like even if there's absolutely no harm at all, okay? Um, so the only way that I can kind of make sense out of the Tea Party or case would be through this sort of argument, and I think that it's it's not a good one. Um, and then there are some, I think, problems with the relationship-based norm, with the go kind of going this way. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip number three. Um, So let me, let's move on to, um, okay, I'm going to move on to six. I'm just in the interest of time and um, I don't want to have to go through some of the other things. You're welcome to look at them and ask me questions if you want, but I'm going to move on to number six. Okay. So one of the problems I think with the relationship is, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is I think it um, lends itself to justifying what we might think are particularly pernicious forms of um, testimonial injustice. In particular, it does not permit, so while it doesn't permit a non-evidentially grounded credibility surplus to those with whom we have special relationships, so it doesn't say that we can kind of give them some sort of boost because they're our friends, it does allow a non-evidentially grounded asymmetry in our treatment of the testimony of, say, friends and non-friends, right? So what this, this is, so what this norm says is, only if I have a prior relationship with you do I owe this to you, okay? So we can imagine all sorts of really problematic cases, right? Like, so I have to, like, kind of just judge my white friends, do you know what I mean? And then these, you know, kind of, you know, my, my, these black strangers with whom I have no relationship, you know, not a teacher relationship, not a jury, really, nothing, nothing. I don't even have to assess them, right? 
I mean, it seems like it really kind of, there's just going to be this um, proliferation of this kind of, a, you know, kind of asymmetrical treatment that would be absolutely justified. Um, and then, like I, I, I've said several times, there's just a straightforward epistemic problem in that if I don't have a prior relationship with someone, but I've got really good evidence that they are a good source of information, I'm not obligated to assess the person. And that just seems like, again, just ignoring evidence. So there also seems to be this problematic epistemic component. So I think the relationship-based approach is not going to be, I don't think it's very promising. <laughs> okay, let me see what time it is. Okay. The next kind of norm I want to take up is um, what's called a, what I'm calling a stakes-based norm of testimonial uptake. Okay, so this one basically says, so it's on your handout here, stakes-based norm for every speaker S and here are H. If the practical stakes for S are high with respect to whether S's testimony is assessed as credible by H, and H makes a credibility assessment of S, then H should match it to the evidence that S is offering the truth and believe, disbelieve, or withhold accordingly on a basis that includes S's testimony. Okay, so, um, so at least one of the positive features of this norm is that it does avoid at least this asymmetry problem that I just mentioned with respect to the relationship-based norm in that this one doesn't say anything about you know, kind of the relationships that we have with people. It's just really about like how much it matters that we believe the person, right? I mean, so um, if the stakes are really high, then we have to assess properly. But if, you know, I don't, I don't kind of have any obligation to, you know, kind of assess people if there's like nothing at stake, you know, I don't know, there's someone on the internet reporting. I mean, if you have the intuition that they're, they're you know, we're not doing anything problematic by not assessing people on the internet, then this would be, I mean, this norm would, would, would work for us, right? Because um, it would say, I don't have any particular obligations to do that, there's so little at stake. Um, and similarly, with respect to the friend, non-friend problem, it has nothing to do with whether you're my friend or not. I could have more of a duty to a complete stranger if it's really important to that person that I, you know, kind of accept their testimony. Um, but it's, you know, very unimportant to a friend. Okay. Okay. So, um, so in a nutshell, my, my problem with this approach is that I just don't think that we have any general obligations at all to be sensitive to the stakes in people's lives. Okay. And I think that if there's going to be a norm that is going to say that we are only obligated to do certain things when the stakes are high for people, then we would have to have, the, there have to be some way in which we are sensitive to those stakes. Okay. I mean, um, I suppose now, now, there might be some things, I mean, so for instance, I mean, some, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that any norm that we have has to be perfectly transparent to us, right? Like, for instance, if knowledge is the norm governing assertion, right, I mean, I could be doing my absolute best and still fail, you know, violating it because, you know, I'm in a Gettier situation or I've got really compelling evidence that's leading me to a false belief or something like that. But in general, we think that there's, I mean, some kind of sense in which we can kind of track, we can kind of aim for having knowledge, right? We think that there's, there's things that we can do to kind of get justified true beliefs, right? Typically, it's through the justification condition, at least in some way. You know, even if you're a reliabilist, right? Like, you just try to choose reliable sources if you're trying to satisfy a norm. The problem I have with this approach is that... Um, Stakes are the sorts of things that can wildly vary for people, wildly vary. They can be grounded in things that are rational, and they can be grounded in things that are highly irrational, right? And I think that when we start looking at like kind of ignorant high stakes cases and ignorant low stakes cases, we get problematic results in both, okay? So, I mean, imagine, for instance, that like, if, if I don't believe you when you report to me, you know, kind of like you identify like birds of prey outside, okay? You identify something as a red-tailed hawk. If I don't believe you, if I don't assess you properly and thereby, you know, kind of take up your belief, you're going to kill yourself, right? I mean, this is just like, the stakes couldn't be higher. This just means so much to you that I believe you with respect to just your reports about birds of prey, 
but I have absolutely no idea. And there's no sense in which I ought to have known this, right? It's just a complete and total fetish of yours. Um, in such a case, it's really unclear why some special norm would be kicking in in this ignorant high stakes case, okay? That I wouldn't, I mean, now keep in mind, I'm not suggesting that we don't have a norm, that there is no norm governing the situation. I'm not saying that we don't have to assist you. I'm saying that I have no particular duty or obligation to be privy, you know, kind of, or to be aware, or to somehow be sensitive to those stakes. Okay? And if I can't, if there is no kind of way in which I can kind of be sensitive to those sorts of stakes, then having a norm that's sort of depending on that seems to be problematic. Okay. Okay. Um, Um, the ignorant um, low stakes cases, I think, are a little bit even more problematic because it doesn't, it's not at all clear to me that, uh, this goes back to the point that I made earlier about the distinction between harming and wronging, right? That we can wrong someone even when there's no overt kind of harm. Um, the other problem here is that um, with ignorant low stakes cases, even if, for whatever reason, I mean, you might be kind of, you know, masochistic, or you just might have kind of, you know, you know, have been subjected to so much abuse that it just like further abuse just doesn't matter at all to you. You know, whatever the case may be, right? You just might be such that no matter what I do to you, it's just, you're just not going to care. Like the stakes are just perpetually low for you, just constantly low. It's not clear to me why the mere fact that like you're just so beaten down or something that it just doesn't matter to you anymore, right? It just, nothing matters. That I, I, like I'm not wronging you by you know, not, you know, not assessing you or not believing you because you're black or because you're a woman or something like that, right? I mean, um, it's not clear to me why we would wanna, wanna, wanna make that claim. Another, th another thought that I just threw in there is it also seems like we might be able to commit you know, kind of um, acts of testimonial injustice against the dead. It's possible, and they have no stakes. I take it. I mean, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we can. I don't know how much we need to quibble about that. But that was just a further thought. Um, okay. So, um, so, so I think that kind of going this this the stakes route, um, relativizing the norm to the state to stakes is 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 not going to work. What time do you want me to stop talking? I've got eight minutes. Okay. Okay. I think I can pull this off in eight minutes. Okay, so very quickly, I've got two more sections to go. Um, the next section, I, I, I mean, I think I can kind of get through the next material in four minutes. So um, the final kind of thing I want to consider, and in, in some respects, I think it's like the most interesting. I think it's the most promising. But I'm not sure it's going to pose a problem, ultimately, would be content-based norms. Okay, norms which say that somehow what you're testifying to matters a great deal. The category I want to focus on, and I think that there are actually other categories that I'm super interested in, I just don't have, you know, didn't have the time to go into, but um, the category that I want to talk about today would be um, kind of like astonishing or highly implausible reports, okay? And whether the norms vary at all for those kinds of reports. So, um, so by um, astonishing, I think the way I'm understanding it, where is this? Um, I'll just understand as reports that are difficult for one to believe, though to varying degrees, depending on the extent to which they call into question or conflict with one's other beliefs. Okay. So there's going to be a spectrum of astonishing reports. On the, high, on the far end, you're going to have like miracles that just kind of conflict with the laws of nature. On the low end, you're going to have just like, you know, like that, you know, one guy sat and ate like eight pizza, eight large pizzas in one sitting. Do you know what I mean? Like it's the kind of astonishing, like, I mean, is that... Humanly, I, I mean, you know, you'd be like eight, large, one person, you know, but it doesn't violate any laws of, I don't think it violates any laws of nature. I do. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so there's going to be a range of, you know, or that like Miami got snow or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Like things that are just like pretty wildly implausible, but like not at all in violation of, of um, any laws of nature. Okay. So, um, one of the reasons why we might think that astonishing reports are important is because um, they, um, 
Well, let me just first highlight two, like what I say, two of two features of astonishing reports. One is that what is regarded as astonishing or implausible can vary among persons depending on their past experiences, background, beliefs, context, and so on. And what strikes one as astonishing might depend in large part on the social gr groups to which one belongs. So one of the reasons why astonishing reports might be particularly interesting in this kind of context when we're talking about credibility assessments, especially both epistemic and moral dimensions of them, is that what strikes us as astonishing can really, really vary, right? So, um, so for instance, you know, kind of, if someone has lived in like a very kind of privileged, you know, has had a very privileged background, they might just find it absolutely wildly implausible that someone was pulled over simply, you know, kind of by a police officer simply because of the color of their skin. I mean, they just might say like, I just find that wildly implausible. Like there's just, obviously there was something else to it. You know what I mean? Um, and our background beliefs and our background assumptions makes a, a big difference to how implausible or how astonishing we find something, right? Um, I mean, if there's a report about, you know, kind of like, you know, um, um, about, um, that has to do with, um, you know, like police brutality, for instance, you know, a police officer might be kind of very primed to find, you know, one feature of it astonishing and other people, you know, kind of who have seen, you know, some of their friends gone down would be, would find another component very, you know, would find another component astonishing. So these kinds of things can really vary from person to per, you know, from person to person based on their background beliefs and by virtue of their membership in particular social groups. <clears throat> um, astonishing reports also have both epistemological and moral significance. I think I'm going to have to, I think I'm going to skip this. I'm getting concerned about my eight minutes, um, which are now probably down to like six or something. Four, you're kidding me. Okay, so I'm gonna skip all of the, you can read all of that. I'm just gonna get to the positive proposal that um, Karen Jones put forward about astonishing reports. Um, and I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Okay, so she says, she's particularly worried about astonishing reports because she thinks that um, there, are, it, there can be problems with like trickle down effect and trickle up effect. Okay, so she's, and she thinks that they're both epistemological and moral problems. So um, this is not her way of putting it, this is my way of putting it, but I, I think we can, you can just bear with me. So one feature of astonishing reports is that it can have this like evidential swamping effect, right? You can have all sorts of information about someone's reliability and like the plot, you know, kind of the you know, evidence on behalf of the, you know, kind of other things that they've said. But one single astonishing report, if it's really astonishing, can kind of undermine all of that, right? It can really swamp all of the past evidence. So, I mean, even if I've got like tons of evidence that like Sandy, I mean, I've, you know, been colleagues with him for eight years and I, you know, all this evidence that he's really reliable. If he tells me on one occasion that he was abducted by an alien on the way to work, like that's just like from their point onward, like this is, there's trouble here. Do you know what I mean? It can really swamp all of the other evidence. Now, one of the things that Karen, someone, Karen, Karen Jones is worried about is that this can swamp it in particularly per epistemically and morally pernicious ways, right? And she's worried about, um, you know, kind of members of like kind of disadvantaged groups kind of already kind of being disposed, you know, kind of to be regarded as untrustworthy and so then that trickles down to their reports. And then she's worried about astonishing reports and them seeming astonishing precisely by virtue of our membership in particular social groups, working its way up to undermine the person's credibility. Okay, so she thinks that both of those can be really problematic. So she proposes this independence rule to try to deal with those problems. She said, conduct separate assessments of the trustworthiness of the witness and the plausibility or probability of what they say, and then and only then determine the credibility of the statement or story, given that it is testified to by that witness. So basically what she's suggesting is that when we have astonishing reports of the sort, the best thing to do is to conduct independent evaluations. You assess the plausibility of the content of the report independently of the testifier, okay? And you conduct independent assessments so that there is not this kind of trickle down or kind of, you know, kind of up, upward effect. Very quickly, I'm just gonna say, I think that there's some significant problems with this approach. The first is that um, it's not clear how this is supposed to work with strangers, right? I mean, when I have no independent evidence to assess their, you know, I'm supposed to have an independent assessment of them. It seems like with strangers, the way that I start assessing them is by virtue of what's coming out of their mouth, right? So it's unclear how I'm going to have these independent assessments. Moreover, it seems like it's particularly, we're particularly prone to having exactly the kinds of instances of testimonial injustice that someone like Karen is worried about 
because I would start assessing you on the basis of other things, right? Like, you know, what you look like, how you sound, you know, your accent or something like that, right? If I don't, if I'm supposed to be giving you an independent assessment from everything that you say. The second one is how am I supposed to assess the content in many cases, especially in cases of expertise? Am I just completely, I might know that you're an expert, you might tell me something. I can't assess the content of it independently of what you're saying. It's precisely because you're an expert that I'm believing it. But what you're telling me is utterly incomprehensible to me, perhaps, right? Um, okay, I'm gonna have to move on. So the reason, here's why I think, I think Jones's proposal went wrong. I think it went wrong in that she starts with a problematic case in which the target beliefs are unjustified. So she starts with worries about like having a racist belief and that trickling down and having an astonishing, like having an astonishing belief about racial, pro racial profiling moving up. But I think the real culprit in all of these cases is just starting off with like, unjustified beliefs at the outset. I don't think that the relationship between astonishing reports and credibility assessments is at all problematic. Um, so the ind independence rule just seems like to me it's just kind of like miss the mark. Okay, very quickly. So what I'm going to propose is um, in, in place is a unified norm that I think um, does not, because I don't think that we have any good reason for thinking that we need special norms governing persons. So um, one last point that I want to make, and I'm glad that I, I only can, you know, that I, I only have about 30 seconds to spend on it because Sandy spent a lot of time on this. One thing that's like surprisingly missing from all of these norms is um, talk about the evidence that we ought to have. Okay, so it's and this is particularly problematic when we're talking about issues of like testimonial injustice because it's very easy to associate, you know, kind of surround ourselves by like-minded people and to just watch the news stories that are just going to kind of, you know, you know, serve our purposes, right? And then it seems like I'd be doing everything right if I'm assessing you on the basis of just the evidence that I just happen to have in my possession, right? Um, and so um, I say that um, we need to kind of assess, we need to kind of take into account not just the evidence that we have for our speaker's credibility, but also the evidence that we ought to have. Um, and so I talk a little bit about normative defeaters. Um, so, um, and I wanted to just highlight, I think Sandy already brought this out, so I'll just mention it. It might be tempting to think that this is just a minor modification to evidentialism, but I actually think, I mean, and I think you brought this up as well, um, you know, kind of, so evidentialism is like a paradigmatic instance of what Sarah Moss calls time slice epistemology, right? I mean, like, so in a forthcoming paper she has, she says, like, she, you know, talks about time slice epistemology versus, you know, kind of diachronic epistemology. Time slice, the paradigmatic cases where everything supervenes on mental states at a time. And so bringing in, I think, the normative element really does deviate from kind of traditional evidentialism. So I just wanted to kind of um, mention that. Okay, so here's the norm that I propose for every speaker S and here are H. If H makes credibility assessments of the relevant members of a context, S1 through SN, then H should match them to the evidence that H not only has, but should have that these speakers are offering the truth and believe, disbelieve, or withhold accordingly on a basis that includes their testimony. Um, there are two ways in which the norm here is non-local. One, the relevant evidence to which our beliefs need to be sensitive is not temporally, temporally local. And that's something that I had talked about earlier um, in terms of um, you know, the, 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 um, the evidence that we ought to have. And then the norm also applies not just to the most immediate speaker, but also to the relevant members in the context. And so just briefly, um, three consequences that I just want to highlight because we're obligated to assess speakers not just in terms of the evidence that we do have but also in relation to the evidence that we should have. It's to our advantage both epistemically and morally to pay close attention to our social environment since there's all sorts of evidence out there that um, we're being held accountable for, right, even if it's not in our possession. I think the scope and contours of testimonial injustice will be directly impacted by evidence coming to light and views evolving. So for instance, if it's pretty you know, kind of widespread, you know, you know, if there's like widespread knowledge about like implicit bias, for instance, we're all going to be kind of, you know, we're, we're on the hook for that, right? Whether we want to kind of process it or not, it's evidence that we ought to have, right? Um, and then having a normative component to this, to, to the, the, this, this, uh, testimonial uptake norm, encourages, I think, the cultivation of various virtues, such as open-mindedness and intellectual humility, these sorts of virtues that, um, that say that we need to kind of look beyond just the, the evidence that we have in our possession because we're also being evaluated in terms of our assessments. And I think this is particularly important when we're talking about phenomena like testimonial injustice. Okay, thanks. Sorry I went over.